to the computer. Okay. Hi, I'm Caroline Levitt. I'm the co-founder, along with my friend and partner, Jenna Blum, of A Mighty Place, the book initiative that was begun at the very start of the pandemic to help bookstores who had to shutter their doors, um, readers who were hungry to know about authors and authors whose tours were canceled. And we have a very special guest today with a very special book, um, Marcy Dermansky, and we have hurricane girl this book is extraordinary it's totally extraordinary i was just telling marcy before we got on that i just bought an extra copy for my son i also want to say that marcy is also a talented artist these are her cats that she sent me and i have it on my bulletin board all the time to look at so marcy is the author of the critically acclaimed novels very nice the red car bad marie and twins um very nice, received rave reviews in the Washington Post, the New York Times, NPR, People Magazine. Uh, Sarah Jessica Parker picked it as one of her favorite summer books. So did I. The Red Car was named the best book of the year by BuzzFeed, San Francisco Chronicle, Flavor Wire, and Huntington Post. Bad Marie was a Barnes and Noble Discover a Great New Writer's Pick, a finalist in the Morning News Tournament of Books, and named one of the best novels of the year in Esquire. So let's hear some of the praise. Oh, you're hurricane me. girl you okay. can just sit and look like a bashedly modest okay. <laughs> okay the new york times book review raised this novel surprises us by blending visceral horror with laugh out loud humor this unnerving stylistic collision is that great is sustained throughout as the concussed and bleeding protagonist manages to drive herself to her mother's house in new jersey trying to feel grateful despite the hole in her head a wickedly entertaining read from first to last the la times beth ann patrick says dermansky uses economical prose to tell of 13 something allison brody whose east coast escape from la producer boyfriend goes pear-shaped when a storm destroys her north carolina home allison's story is wickedly funny and wonderfully combat both satisfying and wanting you, leaving you wanting more. Newsday says, absurdly funny and cheer cheerful. Omari Weeks of Vulture says, nimble prose, touches of dark humor, and flirtations with the surreal. It's just a wonderful, wonderful book. Oh, we have even more, a starred Kirkus. Just a little comedy about the loss of all worldly possessions, near-death assault, brain surgery, and violent revenge. The only bad thing about this book is that you'll likely, you'll likely finish it in one sitting. Starred Kirkus. Okay, okay. so... Welcome, 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 Marcy. I'm so happy to have you here. I love your book. I love your art. And I have a lot of questions to ask. Great, you. great, great. Hi, Carolyn. You are welcome. First of all, I also want to tell people watching, we did have technical difficulties, so you cannot ask our questions right now. But this, this interview is going to live forever on our YouTube station. Um, and also on our Mighty Blaze station, so you can always post comments there. Please buy your book from an independent bookstore. Um, we have a Mighty Blaze like bookshop.org or, you know, just walk out to your favorite one. Okay, so I always want to know what is haunting or obsessing an author into writing a book, probably because that's the way I do things. Yeah. Can you tell us like what it was for you? What was the seed of this book and how did it yeah. Forth. I mean, when I start to write, it's really like a blank screen. There really was just a scene. It's like, what if somebody were to get a beach house and like lose it right away? And, and that was really all I knew going into writing this book was that was what I was going to do to the main character. And I didn't know much about her. And I didn't know what was going to happen after she lost her beach house. I just, I think I've always wanted a beach house and I don't think I'm, I'm going to have one. And maybe it's not even that prudent <laughs> in these, these climate days to have your own beach house. But so that's what I did. And that was really the inspiration was just like that one sort of sentence of an idea. Is that the way it is for all your books that you just have an idea and they yeah it really is like I, starting books is always the hardest part for me because I don't have a plan and I don't know where I'm gonna go and I just sit down and I type and, and if I'm on a good day I'll type something that's like okay this is what I'm gonna keep going with yeah wow that is yeah. amazing that's amazing I just yeah. so you sort of have the writing gene in your DNA that allows you to do that I guess so I mean you have a yeah. different writing gene gene it sounds like so. There's such a sense in this book, too, of that, like every minute 
Mm -hmm. everything can change and yeah. it will change and not the way you expect mm -hmm. how much of the pandemic is responsible for that feeling or is that part of your genetic i think um, i mean the funny thing about the pandemic is i i didn't write through most of the pandemic because um my daughter was virtually schooled you know for a whole year and i couldn't write while she was at home but the really great part was that hurricane girl was about like 90 percent done when when the pandemic, like that's great oh, but it sounds funny great. but because i was already writing it i was able to write the end and basically the only new part of the book was the end and the end is pretty dramatic and i kind of wonder like the end is like a horror movie like it feels like a horror scene like i wanted it to feel like a horror scene like that was not an accident but i wonder if i would have wanted to write something so horrific if it weren't the <laughs> pandemic and maybe not you know i think i think those two have to be tied together but otherwise, I mean, I spent most of the pen. I don't even know what I did. I had an editing job. I had one client. She just kept sending me her book again and again. I was like, I'll take it. It's money because I couldn't really focus otherwise. You know, I couldn't focus nobody, on my own. Stuff. Nobody yeah. could. Nobody yeah. could. But it just feels like that any that sense of any minute made this sort of per perfect pandemic reading. And the thing yeah. that I so deeply admired about this book was that it's so so funny and yet at the same time it's yeah. so so horrifying i mean the <laughs> stuff about the hole in her head and yeah. the concussion and yeah i mean who would think you'd be gleeful reading about that but i was i mean i there was loved it maybe i don't even know like when i wrote about a character who has a hole in her head the funny thing is and this is in the book like what's fiction what's not fiction is i really there was a student in my graduate school class who literally and i wrote a story called hole in her head like that wasn't made up and it was i don't remember a word of it but it was the worst story ever but like that came into me my head when i was writing i was like that's so funny wow. that i'm actually writing about a hole in the head wow. like for a little while i even had that as like a tentative title because it was just like stealing from my former student my no my Did former Bless me. Yeah. Did you know how she got the hole in her head? I mean, could oh, you I'm not sure. I don't remember a word of it. It was just bad. Oh my God. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I just don't think that writer is watching. So fingers crossed. That's so, did you research brain trauma? I did research and, brain injury for sure. Yeah. Because I didn't know anything. And wow. So, and what, what surprised you the most about what you learned? The one that, I mean, I, I could have did more research, obviously. And, and, I, and the thing I learned the most is that people, when they wake up, because there's so much swelling in their brain, and I put this in the book, that so when she wakes up in a hospital, she's sort of sit up and she's got restraints around her. And they do that, apparently. That was surprising. Did you, did you feel freaked out when you were writing that? Because I um, felt freaked out reading it, but I couldn't stop. <laughs> that's so funny. No, I didn't feel freaked out. But I mean, I thought it was kind of, it was sort of funny how she kept on saying to her doctor, well, I didn't consent to my having surgery and she'd already had it. So it was kind of <laughs> ridiculous, but she wouldn't let that go. So that seemed funny to me. It was funny. There, in mm. fact, there's one quote that I love where Allison says she wonders, what would it be like to be a man and not a nice man? Mm -hmm. And that propels her into action and by the end of the book she's really reclaimed herself so this is a roundabout way of getting to my question about what kind of feminist are you oh i mean i was just sort of raised a feminist like it wasn't mm -hmm. a question like i didn't have a choice whether or not i was a feminist like my mother worked for this um feminist newspaper that was called new directions for women and it was it was like it was like more lefty. Like I think they used to criticize Ms. Magazine. Like they saw Ms. Magazine almost as their adversary. So it was just what what I had to be. And and I didn't. I mean, I think sometimes children of really liberal parents can go in the other direction, right? And that's awful. But I just I just went with what my mother told me. So I love yeah. it. So you didn't yeah. rebel against your mother at all? No, no. And then like my mom always wanted to be a writer. So, you know, she wasn't, oh. you know, so here I'm, I'm kind of doing what she wanted to do. So she's like super proud. So that's nice. That is really nice. That's really yeah. nice. Um, so, you know, I actually, I, I loved Allison. I just, mm -hmm. I worried about her and I loved yeah. her and I wanted to talk to her. And I want to know, like, how is she doing now? Do you have any sense of what she's doing now or how she is? Or? Well, it's funny. I got a really nice email from a friend who finished the book. And, and like, I kind of always leave endings like a little bit open. I think there is an open ending and yeah, it's really, really similar, which I didn't do on purpose to Bad Marie, which has an open ending. And so, I mean, there's, there's two different ways you could take it. You could take this book really realistically and you could think about like what really, really bad stuff could happen to her. And, and I don't want that to happen to her. No, so. I don't think bad stuff happens to her. No, 
So, so my, my, my friend actually wrote to me, she was like, from a, from a realistic standpoint, she's like, oh, she's going to get therapy and she won't be held accountable for any of this. And she's going to live happily ever after. And I was like, sure. Like, why not? Right. Like, why yeah, not? Imagine why, not? why not? Yeah, why not? Do we the book? Bit, I don't think so. I want to talk a little bit more about the whole issue of feminism because okay. Allison is a feminist who wants to be taken care of. Yes. And I wonder <laughs> why is wanting to be taken care of, not all the time, but right. Sometime considered unfeminist. I mean, can't yeah. you go out and conquer the world and still go home and be really glad that someone's done the dishes and they're making you dinner? Right. I mean, I feel like maybe this was a kind of feminist I think that I took on that I don't think my mother said, but I think this whole idea with being feminist is also being self reliant. So if right. you're like a feminist, you're going to like make your own money, for instance. Oh, yeah. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 So I feel like, like, so I feel like I actually do feel like sort of embarrassed. Like, so this is. Me too. Like, how can you be a feminist and want a rich husband? Like, like, so I mean, you like, not? We, I mean, like, right? why can't like, you mix the two? It's like yeah. So but, like, here's a funny thing. Like when I was like starting my career, like my huge, I don't know if you envy people. The person who I think I envied the most always was Sofia Coppola, who's a filmmaker because she, Sofia Coppola comes from royalty, you know, like right, the Coppola right. family, the Coppola right. money and the Coppola love and support. Right. right and right. so I, I think that she's, I mean, she like Lost in Translation when it came out was just like my favorite movie for the longest time. Oh, it's a time. wonderful movie. It's so wonderful. But I don't think she could have been that successful and that ambitious. I don't think she could have had even the notion that she could direct her own feature film. I don't know how old she was. If she hadn't had that kind of support. Yeah. Whole that's, life. that's really, really interesting. And I think yeah. that's really, really true because, yeah. you know, if you grow up with any sort of dysfunctional, family or not with a lot of money yeah. you have a very different attitude towards success than somebody right. who's grown out of privilege and had somebody saying of course you can do this storyline and you don't have internships because you don't have internships and you don't it is it is really a case of who you know what contacts you yeah. have what internships you can get right. who's going to you know if yeah. you if you write a book and your parents are famous they can take that book to random house you don't have to get right it. yeah like lena dunham you know, came from like her well, parents i are, mean like, I, want, I, I sort of so jealous that. like i'm just sounding so petty because i don't come from a place of like non-privilege but i do feel like i did it myself and i did have a first husband who had no money and i mean like wow like so you know if i had to do that again <laughs> Yeah, but you know what? My yeah. first husband had a lot, had a ton of money. Oh, really? He that was like, oh my God, he was really, really rich. And I was miserable. We never okay. went on vacations yeah. because he was kind of cheap. And I was not happy. Um, and when I left, I didn't take any alimony whatsoever. You didn't? See, it's no, so funny, but I'm like, I wish you had. I wish I, I had now get too. It. You probably at the hated time, it. Yeah. At the time, I felt, well, that's really feminist. I'm going to make it my own. I'm going to make right. it on my own in New York City. So there. Yeah. And then, of course, 10 years later, I thought, gee. Oh, you see, so yeah. I could have taken, like, at least 10,000. Because we were sort of raised not we to, raised I feel not like. to, raised yeah. not to. But I think that's really interesting. It comes across so well with Allison. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to talk about, there's a fabulous mix of horror and comedy. You know, I'd laugh, and then my hand would go across my mouth, and absolute horror I was wondering if was it is that is that just the way you are in real life or were you consciously mixing the two to achieve that wonderful tone I think I don't know because I can't go around saying that I'm like funny do you know what I mean um <laughs> but they made you laugh I can't be funny on purpose like I don't think I could be like a stand-up comic I don't I don't think it's I could interesting write, I don't think I could write comedy but I think all of my work has been considered comedic and I think I like to have sentences that have balance. So I know like I'll write one thing in the next sentence and I don't have an example, which I wish I did because I should get that ready. It'll say the exact opposite. I do that all the time. And so I think that's the horror and the humor. And I think I know that it's there. Like, I think when I write a funny line, like I know it, I'm like, oh, good. But I I, I don't know how I, I mean, how do we know how we do anything? Like that's We don't thing. know. We don't. we don't know. Do you, um, what you've done with a draft? Do you show it to anybody before you? Send um, well, it to I'm really agent? careful because I've I've had in the like I've had bad readers in the past. You know what I mean? Oh, and yeah. Bad readers, and and so mainly my and I'm really really blessed like blessed. I'll use that word. Like my first reader for them is I have a friend and she just says everything I do is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so there's so many more pages. Like, it's like kind of like, I don't believe her, but I love her and I need her. And she, she just says, that. everything is great. So she's my first reader. She just makes me feel really, really good. But she's also smart. You know what I mean? Okay, so she's so not just good. like a complete fool. <laughs> I don't, yeah, but anyway, so she's my first reader, and then the next reader, nothing constructive, like nothing, like it's still just, it's just me getting praised as I go, and that helps me a lot, it's like a hand holder, and then I send it to my agent, and that, he's my second reader, and he usually, he usually is like, yes, but, and so. That's so interesting, because yeah. I always say that I can take criticism that can be brutal, as long as it's based on the fact of, I think you're talented. I love your writing. And then the butt, then I can listen to the butt because I yeah. feel like, okay, that person's on my, but like you, I've also had readers who are just like awful. I mean, I had one reader say, you know what? Every writer has a book that should be burned. This is yours. Go yeah. ahead. I'll wait for you to get the matches. Like, who can say that to a person? Like, do you know what I mean? Like that, that person must not be a, we don't have a happy to be, like that's a bad person. I feel like that's not a happy person um, no, because I, people can be wrong. You know what I mean? They yes. So wrong. Right. What if you do take a match to your your book? You know, like if you give it to the wrong reader, you're not. It can kill it. you. It yeah, can kill it you. can actually destroy you if you give. They're it to really the wrong damaging. Reader. Like writing professors are really damaging. Like if you're not, if you're like when I went to writing programs, they were like some teachers pets, and if you weren't the teacher's pet, like the whole program didn't seem useful. You know, so. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that's really true. It's like I've yeah. sort of stayed away from writing, even though I teach in writing. Program, that's hilarious. Yeah. I stayed away from one myself because I've yeah. had such terrible experiences. I think it can be that. really, really bad, bad experiences. And I, I mean, writing workshops, like I knew, like when I was writing in graduate school, I kind of knew what I was doing was good. Like actually, it was better than a lot of people's. But the people who didn't write as well as you did, they sensed it and they were mean and they were just... <laughs> like mean comments you'd it's be like thank terrible. you it's, yeah. you know it's it's terrible I mean it's yeah. like sometimes it's like reading the reviews on like a place like Goodreads or something yeah. or people will say you know what I thought this character was garbage and should right. be thrown in the trash and so should the writer and you look at it and say really and then yeah. you look at to see like well what other books has this right yeah read? but then you're like, this weird path I... right where you're looking at yeah. like this person who's been mean to you you're like i totally have done that and sometimes they'll just not only say the book is garbage or the writer's garbage like when they say the main character is garbage and the main yeah, character i take offense <laughs> it's like sort of based on you maybe perhaps who knows you know so i'm like yep yeah, sure <laughs> well, see, I would really love it if you would read okay just the first just two pages just two, two pages. pages okay two pages. well then I think the easiest thing really the the, the opening of the book is like yeah, read the pages. opening yeah, okay, yeah read the opening I would okay. love to hear that all right oh wait I've got I've got glasses I've got a cat looking at me from the floor oh we're going to talk about cats next okay good <laughs> will you stay there Ginger so I can show you off later all right so this is yeah okay I'm going to read the first two pages because it ends in a nice spot. Okay. Alice and Brody bought a beach house. She was 32 years old, sick of everybody and everything. All she wanted to do more than anything really was swim. The beach house was small. It was in North Carolina in foreclosure. She'd put cash down, emptying her accounts, everything that she had. She used money saved from waitressing, money saved from a small inheritance from her father when he died almost a year ago. She'd sold a script too and made some okay money with that. A solid chunk. It was a horror script. It would not necessarily make a good film, but a famous actress had agreed to star in it. And so there could be more money, more scripts, success. Allison had been seen as a movie producer's pretty girlfriend. She could have been known in her own right. Probably it had been stupid to leave Los Angeles just when she, her career had started taking off and there were so many places to swim. The movie pro producer, for instance, had a beautiful swimming pool. Maybe, maybe leaving had been stupid. Maybe Allison wanted to create art one day after she swam. Maybe one day she would want to have a cat. It's all on the first page. The movie producer was allergic to cats. Maybe she actually wanted to live alone and certainly not with a man who had hit her. It had only happened a few times, exactly three, but it also seemed possible that it could happen again, even though the movie producer had promised that it wouldn't. She drove cross country doing the speed limit, buying coffees from Starbucks along the way. And the beach house turned out to be perfect. Two small bedrooms and a bathroom on the second floor with a view of the ocean. A front porch where Allison could drink her coffee and breathe in the ocean air. Almost all Allison knew about North Carolina was from a long ago vacation. And it was wonderful, her favorite childhood memory. 
The road trip had been insanely long, a caravan with another family. They had taken regimented bathroom stops. When she woke, she had been delivered to a house with an oval swimming pool and a view of the ocean. Allison remembered a large pink dolphin float in the pool with a cup holder built into it for drinks. All the parents got drunk every night and everyone laughed a lot and the kids were allowed to do whatever they wanted. And that's I love it. I love it. I love, you know, some readers when they read, Mm -hmm. there's like a writerly voice. Yeah. Like when you read, you just sort of pull us into the whole story world. Thank you. Wonderful. It's absolutely wonderful. So what I also loved about Allison was that she did go for the revenge, but you know what? (laughs) good people can do bad things and you can still love them like yeah. we love her um she has these moments that i love she talks to her belly she has a moment with a cat mm. can you talk about like how you went about creating her like did you feel her talking in your head or did you just you know go into the zone and things would reveal themselves to you I mean, I think I definitely go into a zone and reveal myself. Yes, exactly. And sometimes I don't know. Like, I don't, like, I think, like, it's funny, like, that first page was rewritten so much. And I think I got it all in there. Like, the cat's in there. The swimming pools <laughs> are in there. Um, the horror script, which is going to lead right, to horror. Right. And so the beach house, it's all in there. And I didn't do that on the first draft because I didn't know. Like, how could you know? And so I think every time as I keep writing, that's how I write. I right. just keep writing and moving forward. And I don't. I don't get to the end of a first draft. I don't need these anymore. I don't get to an end of a first draft and then revise. I just revise the whole time. And so, so usually the beginning is way more worked over than the end. Oh, really? So you don't, you would never like have a first draft and say, okay, now I'm going back to the beginning and just sort of do it in increments. I feel like everything has to be right before I can keep going on. on. I feel like by the end of the, by the end of my first draft, I'm probably on like my sixth or seventh draft. Wow, yeah. that's really interesting. Um, so tell us about your own personal relationship with swimming and water. Because okay. that water, that image is like through this. And I was just really curious because I'm terrified of the water. You're terrified. See, that's, wow. <laughs> it's just swimming, yeah. See, I'm like, interesting. Like, that's like a whole different way of existing on, on this earth than that you and I have. I mean, I went swimming today. Today, my daughter didn't have school and it's like, almost 90 degrees and we went to oh, a lake it's disgusting, and we, yeah we went swimming at a lake and that's one reason like why I have wet hair because I had to like rush home and take a shower before this it felt very unprofessional that I just showed up right on time um but swimming just makes me feel good like if I have a headache if I feel really worried I just go underwater and everything is just better like if I'm in the ocean it's just like instant happiness when I'm jumping waves it's, I don't even know how that works and so, you don't you don't worry about box jellyfish <laughs> no. or sharks or no I mean I think if you go swimming in Cape Cod you need to worry that there's jellyfish I mean or not maybe not jellyfish but sharks yeah that's those are the big fears and I and, I, and, and I'm lucky because they now that you say it like it makes sense like it seems completely rational to have those fears but I don't um, there was one time like two years ago when I went to Asbury Park and they didn't let people swim. And I think that actually there was a red flag. I think that actually was because there were jellyfish. Like I, oh, so I think I have this like trust, like I really do trust these beaches that I have to in New Jersey, for instance, you have to pay to go onto the beach. And so the lifeguards are there. They're there. And they have right, their flag. Right, right. So right, I, right. I just don't feel like I have to worry. And, and, and in New Jersey, for instance, there aren't well there haven't been sharks I won't say there aren't sharks because I'm sure there are I've seen dolphins in Asbury Park you know? yes I've seen dolphins isn't that nice I do go to the beach but I just oh, okay. don't go in the water <laughs> okay so we can we can go to the beach together and I can swim yeah can, yeah I'll just wave umbrella. for you from showers and say look right. out look out I can send you out I, to get lemonade I want to talk about your extraordinary talent as okay. a painter yeah Marcy sent this to me and I love it so much it is on my bulletin board so mm-hmm. which is right over there so I can look at it all the time when I work and I love it. Have you always painted? What does no. painting, what does painting think, do for you that writing does not? I like I like painting. It's just there's there's no anxiety. Do you feel, I mean, there's no anxiety at all connected to painting. If I don't paint for a month, I don't feel bad about myself. Like if I don't write for a month, I feel awful. Like if I paint, it's just right. kind of fun. I don't feel... I started painting when my daughter was like about three or four. I had never painted for my life, but because she was just doing art. And I was like, oh, well, right. I might paint with her. So I'm not bored. And then, and then my work was coming out. Well, like I liked it. And, and what I think like what, what my mom always says, at least is that my brother and sister both went to like art school. 
like they both have fine art degrees. And I think I just sort of said, not for me and just assumed I didn't have talent. And so writing was my thing. And then I'm like, oh, I make these paintings and they're nice. And I don't, I don't challenge myself with my art, by the way. Like um, I don't work big. I like small things and I only use watercolor. One time I tried to use oil paint. I'm like, this is awful. I hated <laughs> it. Yeah. And, and so, it's so funny. It, it's, yeah. you know, it, it's so funny because in high school, I, I was also a painter and a writer and I got a scholarship to Mass College of Art while I'm oh. in high school and I took these special classes. Wow. But I felt the same way. It was like, I didn't like it unless I could just do it quickly. Oh, really? Have fun with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I, I guess paintings can take hours and hours. Yeah. Yeah. No. I just do it with watercolors now. And it's okay. just, you know, easy, safe. Whereas writing is like where I have to focus. And yeah. that's like for my mental sanity. But okay. I just want to show this glorious picture again <laughs> look at that <laughs> look at the expression i love it i absolutely yeah. love it okay i have two last questions okay and they're the questions i always ask the first okay. one is what's obsessing you now and why beside politics not, not uh, politics. yeah i'm actually it's interesting i'm not obsessed with politics i have really? been Wow. Like, I, yeah, I used to be like, I just, I definitely did get burned out. Like Biden got elected and right. I find him mildly disappointing. And like, er, there are these trials going on right now. And I, I'm just not, I just, I just can't. I just felt like it took so much out of me. So that's not, I'm still care and I still sent money, but I answered your question anyway. So we're talking about that. I don't know. Like right now, literally, I think it's summer and really getting to swim enough is what's what obsesses me. Like that's in my book and that's just true. And so right. do yeah. you feel different when you finished a book? Like, do you feel that you've learned either a writing lesson that you can apply to your next book yeah. or a personal lesson <laughs> about yourself through your characters? Doesn't that sound great? Yeah, it would sound. That's why I'm asking. I'm always hoping you're going to say yes, absolutely. Oh, no, no to either. <laughs> Yeah. Not either. Yeah. yeah. You know what? I've asked that question of so many writers. And they oh, really? The same thing. No. Oh, so do you ever get a yes? No, never. Really? Oh, never hilarious. Really? So never. We, we never learn and we never have anything of <laughs> value from the experience. I mean, that can't be true, right? Um, I don't know. I think, I don't know. I would like to say no, it can't be true. Because I think just writing, I think it, it's more of a chance that you change personally in some way. Because you've lived through this other person's life in true. your book. Um. I don't know about the learning things that you can apply to other novels because part of the fun and terror is trying to do everything all differently. Yeah, like what, what would be a big fear for me is like, do you know, do some writers, I'm, I don't have one in mind where you like love their first book so much and then you don't really like what they keep on doing. And to me, that would be heartbreaking. You know what That I would mean? be terrible. Yeah. yeah. I could not do. That I mean, I have a thing right now and I'm fine with it, by the way, but people are, whenever I write, when, I write so many books. Whenever I write a new book, people always be like, oh, I really like that, but I like bad and read better. Like, that's oh, I hate favorite. when people say that. Yeah, you this is a message to readers out there. Don't never say that to a writer. It's terrible. <laughs> Considering like if a writer had two children yeah. and you go to them and you say, oh, your, your youngest is so beautiful. Um, yeah. You know, I like the oldest too, but the youngest. I, mean, I love that you get that because I think that's the first time I ever said that out loud, honestly. It is no, I hate that. I hate that. Okay. I will tell you that I look at every single one of your one of your books as something new and I love them all. I that's mean, so it's nice. like it's like a different delight, but it's like I'd like to go to a dinner party with all of them. That'd be fun. You know, I just <laughs> sort of go around the table. <laughs> I'd be a little, I mean, I was thinking in college, in college, one of my writing professors, like my final, like I got this final letter. And she wrote about how, 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 what, what a good job I did at writing unhinged female characters. Oh, you know, I, I still I, hear I, that though. So they're all unhinged, know, right? They're all human and they're okay. all wonderful. Okay. Yeah. My last question okay. is what question did I ask that I should have, that you really want to talk about? <laughs> I just think you did a great job. Like, it's nice to talk to you. I feel like, except for the, it feels like we, it's been easy and good, except for it's the technical. It's easy thing. and good. Yeah, yeah so. it's really, we've got to hang. We've got to yeah. get together and hang. So I yeah, we tell, will, okay. We will. Okay. I want to tell everybody out there, please, this book, buy it from your local indie. 
Yeah. It's just, it's so wonderful. It's the perfect reading experience for now. And once again, I bought it. I bought an extra copy for my son because I, I just want, I want everybody to read it and share it. Um, you can rewatch this video and enter questions and comments. I'll go, I'll uh, promise to go look because I feel like it was my yeah. fault for, for problems. <laughs> it so, wasn't yeah. your fault. Don't apologize okay. at okay. YouTube or on Facebook. Yeah. And uh, thank you all for being here. And mm -hmm. we'll see you later. Marcia, okay. just stay on. I'm going to stay on. Thanks, guys.